Hello, everybody. I am so glad that you are all here today. I know we are right at one o'clock, so I'm going to obviously stall for a minute just to make sure that people can get in, but um, you can also just watch it again because there is going to be a replay. Everything is being recorded and you can easily just pause right now if you want, if you're not ready, if you don't have that cup of coffee yet, you can pause and then you can press play again. And if you have to leave during the webinar, you don't have anything to worry about, just come on right back later and you'll be able to watch it. And I'll leave it up for at least a week. So um, let's get to this. Hi, I'm Alice, the Fabric Ninja. And today we are going to be talking about our sewing machine. We are going to demystify our sewing machine. And just let's do a little, a couple little things first. Um, I already mentioned the housekeeping of there will be a replay, but I also wanted to tell you a little bit about myself and the person who's helping us today. So let me switch over to my slides real quick to make that easy. One moment. Here we go, okay. So down at the bottom of here, you can see if you wanna check out more information about me, fabricninja.com is my website. And on Facebook, we have the Fabric Ninja Sewing Circle that I would love for you to join. And everywhere on social media, you can find me at the Fabric Ninja. So Instagram, I don't really use Twitter, YouTube, all of those things. It's just The Fabric Ninja, so you can find me at any of those places. So welcome. I am joining you today from Indianapolis. Well, just outside of in Indianapolis in a small town. Um, where are you all joining me from? Please, um, in the chat window here, just type in where you're joining me from so I know and we can kind of get an idea of where everyone's at. So here in Indianapolis, it is 2 p. I'm sorry, 1 p.m. And I think I got it right that on the West Coast, it's 10 a.m. So we're all kind of at different times. Um, but I hope you are all going to be able to hang out with me for a while as we talk about sewing machines. So today, my helper is my husband. He is um, upstairs. He's two floors away from me. I'm in the basement. So we can't even yell and hear each other. But... He is going to be helping us out in the chat window today. He is going to be taking your comments from the chat window and sticking them into a, a Google document so I can read them. I know, right, technology is amazing. We are truly living in the future. Um, so you can see uh, we have twin seven-year-olds and you can see a picture of them there. We were at our friend's wedding. He is truly a technology guru and a wonderful husband. And thank you so much for helping me out today, Dan, because there's no way I can chat, track a chat window and talk at the same time. So also, if we have any technology issues, he's going to make sure that I know about them. So for any reason, you know, you can't hear me or I have a window up that makes absolutely no sense, he's going to make sure I know and translate anything you guys say to me so that I can understand what's going on. So let's just get to this. We're here to talk about sewing machines. So um, do you have a sewing machine? That's kind of our first step here is do you actually have a sewing machine? And it's totally okay if you don't because today you're gonna learn enough information to be able to buy the sewing machine you actually want because although we're gonna find out a lot more about them and know that sewing machines are really very similar to each other, there are some things about sewing machines that you may want or may not care about. So do you own a sewing machine? That is the first question I have for you today. And after that, I would like to know, have you actually taken that sewing machine out of the box and used it? And it's okay if you have a sewing machine in the closet in the back corner hiding in the Harry Potter cupboard under the stairs that's totally okay that machine is not too old to be used it can be used and you can be able to use it so we're we have so much to get into I'm jumping ahead of myself so let me slow down and find out do you guys actually own a sewing machine have you actually taken it out of the box and are you using it at all? 
that can be you used it once, maybe back in high school, maybe you took it out and stared at it and weren't really sure what to do. I'm gonna work on giving you the confidence today so that you can take that sewing machine out of the box and actually use it. So when we're talking about sewing, one of the ways that can help us feel more motivated is to figure out why sewing is important to us. Is there something that you really want to be able to do that's pulling you to be able to sew? Do you just wanna learn a new skill? Or do you have something in mind, that goal that you want to do? Maybe it's a little goal, super tiny goal, or maybe it's an enormous goal. So a super tiny goal would be like, I want to be able to sew the button back on my shirt when it falls out, or I want to be able to mend my pants when the hem falls out. A tiny goal is excellent, but you also have to think about your big goal. Do you want to be able to sew your own wardrobe? Do you want to be able to maybe make a bra? Or maybe your big goal is to be able to make couch cushions and home decor. Think about why sewing is important to you. And while we're talking about that, I want to tell you about why sewing is important to me or a couple of stories about where sewing has really been a rock star in my life. So let's first start about sanity, therapy, escape, whatever you wanna call it. Some people say that sewing is better than therapy. I'll let a therapist decide that, but sewing is really a way where you can just let yourself go and be creative. My best friend, Mary, whom I actually taught to sew, or she claims I did, I don't remember doing it, let's be honest, but she claims I taught her to sew and she uses sewing as a creative outlet. She's a public school teacher, and when she's had a stressful week or month, her self-made wardrobe just explodes. And she's actually able to make things that are in the colors that she likes and the styles that she likes. And so her wardrobe really makes her happy. She sees it and she smiles. That therapy she gets from being able to use her sewing machine and to just fall down a creative hole is her goal and why she sews. So one of the other reasons that sewing is great is because it's super useful. First, I have a little story about what happened to me at my old job. I walked in one morning and my boss walked up walked over to me and she had a sheepish look on her face and she just held up a pair of pants and she's like can you help I'm like well yeah of course but we had a huge grant meeting that day and these were the pants to her power suit and the hem had fallen out and she didn't want to ask me because I mean it's not my job to sew for her I'm an assistant director like but of course I did. I popped out that sewing kit that I have in my purse at all times, which by the way, I've lost a lot of sewing kits over the years to different sewing emergencies. I just hand the kit over and they get to keep it. But um, I definitely saved the day that day. That power suit looked great. The pants were hemmed and we got the grant at the end of the day, which is really, I, I think the best part about that. And um, I mean, lastly, so many people who were able to sew really save the day recently. I know that masks can be a touchy subject for people. A lot of people don't like wearing them, but the fact is, is that all of those people who knew how to sew were really able to save the day. And all those people who were hoarding fabric um, magically had a lot of fabric that they were able to help with. And so sewing, made a huge difference in that case. It, it actually saved lives. So sewing can be a huge star. So let's, let's talk about what we're gonna talk about today then, now that I've told you why sewing is important to me. So we are going to talk about how a sewing machine works, the most important parts of the sewing machine, um, the 
main sewing machine features, the ones that kind of happen on all sewing machines and the ones that are just special features that only happen on some sewing machines. And then I'm gonna give you some tips on how to get started with your sewing machine. Okay. So my goal today is to give you the best information about how to use your sewing machine so you can make decisions as you move forward, either buying a sewing machine or just learning to sew. So we are gonna improve your skills so you have a chance to really love sewing and take care of that frustration. Let me figure out where my next slide is. Sorry about that. Okay. So sewing is important. I just talked about that, but it really can help people feel good about themselves and have the confidence to unlock their new abilities and unlock sewing and just generally make themselves happy. And once I teach you more about your sewing machine, you're going to know how to save money by altering things, mending things, fix issues with your sewing machine early on because you'll actually know what's going on with your sewing machine and how it works. And in the end, it's all going to be less frustrating because you know how it works and you know where to look for problems. So let's talk a little bit about the myths that are associated with sewing. Um, some people don't want to start sewing because they think that you just have to know so much already. You have to know how to read a pattern. You have to know about fabric. You don't have to know everything when you get started. Everyone was a beginner once. All you have to do is take it a little bit at a time. Learn what you need for the project you're working on. You don't have to learn what you need for every project you might eventually experience. You just have to decide what you need to know now. So you don't have to know how to read a pattern. You don't have to know about every piece of fabric that's out there or all the things about all the sewing tools. All you need to know is what you need for the one project you're working on. Maybe you've tried to start learning to sew before and it's too complicated or you don't think you'll be able to understand. And a lot of that has to do with your teacher. Maybe once before in your life you've experienced a teacher in school that you did not understand at all math i mean math is a good example for most people you probably had a math teacher at some point in your life where you're like i don't get this at all i'm never going to understand math but then you get another teacher eventually and they explain stuff and you're like that wasn't so hard after all it's not too complicated. You just have to find the right teacher, the one that works with you and the one that works with your style. So my suggestion is if you're going to do the whole YouTube route and try to look for a teacher, which we all know is difficult because there's a lot of bad teachers out there. Look for videos that are from your point of view. Look for videos where when you are watching the video, you're seeing what would be in front of your hands. So you're really looking at what would happen. That makes it way easier for you to be able to understand what's going on. So if you're not sure where to begin, I mean, I know I talked about some YouTube videos. There's so many YouTube videos out there, but that it's complicated because so many people are not good teachers or you watch the video and you're like, I'm more confused than when I started. So another great place to begin is to actually get out a book. I know crazy, but sewing books have been around for a long, long time. And I love vintage sewing books. It seems like the modern books, they kind of glance over a lot of things that you might have questions about. And if you get a vintage sewing book, they talk about everything every single little bitty step they talk about. And so those are super useful. I am gonna let you know that I also have a sewing course that opened today and it's called Zero to Sew. It's a course that's just for beginners and we'll talk about that more now. But if you are looking for a course, it's certainly an option you might wanna check out. So you don't need expensive special equipment to get started sewing. You don't need all the things to be able to start. All you need is your sewing machine. You need 
some scissors, needle, thread, you don't need a lot of equipment. Historically, people just had needle, thread, fabric, and scissors. You can sew at a sewing machine and you're golden. And lastly, sewing is easy. Yeah, this is a myth. Sewing is not easy. It's not the first thing that you're gonna come up with. It's not you can sit down and just do it. You need some instruction and that's okay. Not everything is supposed to be just sit down and you magically know how to do it. That's literally why I'm here is because I know it's not easy. You need help. So looking at all these myths here, can you guys take a moment to write in the comments which of these is you? Which of these com which of these myths are what's keeping you from sewing? I realize there may be some people here who are already sewing, but think back to when you started or maybe something that's keeping you from advancing. Are you not able to keep sewing or get better at sewing because you don't know how to take the next step? Are you afraid of your sewing machine because it's just too complicated? Take a moment and write where you are in this, where you are in this project process and tell me what's holding you back. Okay, I'm gonna take just a moment to look at these comments to see if I can address any of the questions that you guys are coming up with off the bat. Okay, I see going back, we have people from all over. Wow, that's amazing. Scotland, the United Kingdom, all over the United States. Wow, that is so cool. Okay, so we have people of lots of different experience levels, a wide variety of brands of sewing machine. Excellent. You'll get to um, meet my team a little bit later. Um, and we have a lot of people talking about tension issues and you guys would like me to cover that. Absolutely, we will talk about tension. Um, and a lot of people sewed masks. Awesome, you guys are amazing. So let's head on to actually time to understand our sewing machine. So this, here we go. This is my team. This is my team of sewing machines. So when you guys are talking about all the different brands and maybe you're worried that, oh, she's not gonna understand mine. It's a different brand. I totally get it. But sewing machines, are 95 to 98% identical. Yeah, they are the same. So all four of those sewing machines that you see there, they all have the same pieces, they all have the same parts. Sometimes they just look a little bit different, but they all actually work the exact same way. So when you're looking at a sewing machine to buy, they throw in all of these words like, number of stitches, you know, they throw out these huge numbers like it can do 100 stitches or it can do 58 stitches. Most people use five stitches, if that, most of the time. So all those extra stitches and all of those accessory packages that sewing machine companies throw in really are just there in some ways to confuse you because sewing machines are basically the same. So all you need to do is think about what those extra parts are that you really care about and we will get into those features in just a moment so these are the common features of every sewing machine but i gotta make a little bit of a caveat here if you are if you have a budget sewing machine and i'm going to put budget in huge quotations here i'm going to define that as a sewing machine that costs under a hundred dollars and you probably get it from a big box store. So these sewing machines that fall into that category, they often take away a completely basic function, like changing the stitch width. I know, why would you take away a basic function? But it makes it less expensive, it makes it cheaper. And those sewing machines are hitting a very specific market and there's nothing wrong with them. It's just that I'm going to talk about the basic parts of a sewing machine. And you may look at your sewing machine later and be like, it doesn't have one of these parts. What are you talking about? So they do actually have ways to adjust the width, but it's all just done on the dial. 
So you can see these dials here and these three different sewing machines I actually went to Joann's and just took pictures of all the sewing machines that were for sale. And on a sewing machine, you are going to have multiple stitches, whether it's going to be four or five stitches or hundreds of stitches. You're going to have multiple stitches, except we're going to go back for a second. You see that green sewing machine in the front there? That is my vintage singer. Her name's Old Faithful. Very long story there. Um, nonetheless, she doesn't have multiple stitches. She goes straight stitch only. You can change her stitch width. And she has reverse. I know. Fancy. But that's, that's a vintage sewing machine. It's really old and it has an attachment to create other stitches. But let's go back to what we'll, we'll stick with modern sewing machines here for a moment. They're going to have multiple stitches. They're going to have a straight stitch. They're going to have a zigzag stitch. You're going to be able to adjust the length of the stitch. So whether it's little tiny stitches right next to each other or if it's big honking stitches next to each other. And when it's a zigzag, you're going to be able to adjust the width of it as well. So whether it's going to be a wide zig and a zag, or if it's going to be really narrow. On some sewing machines, you are going to adjust the move the needle by that width adjustment. So when you're on a straight stitch, you move the stitch width back and forth, and it will actually move the needle. Other sewing machines that have a, a different function on moving the needle, but all sewing machines that are modern have a way to move the needle when you're in straight stitch. And um, lastly, they're going to have two spool pins, almost always. And I'm not at the sewing machine yet, but I will make sure to tell you all about a spool pin and what those are for. So then we get into accessory packages and all that other stuff that makes sewing machines different. But sewing machines are really very often just the same. So to f understand our sewing machine, we really have to just understand how it works. So before I make this graphic move for you, I want you to take a moment and envision your sewing machine and how it works. So we have a thread on the top. That is your spool of thread and it winds down through the machine all the way to our needle. And you have thread on the bottom in a bobbin, which is a tiny little spool. And it goes in the machine, either in the front or the top, depending on your machine. And the needle thread, when it comes down, catches the bobbin thread. And that is what creates a lock stitch. So it literally locks the two stitches together. So the needle comes down and that bobbin thread grabs it. And then the needle thread comes back up and they are hooked together right in level with your fabric, hopefully, if your tension's right. If not, you adjust it until it can be. So let's get this graphic working so you can all see how it works. So that needle, which is threaded, comes down from the top and then the bobbin grabs it. That is called the bobbin race. That's the part going around, bobbin hook, I'm sorry. The bobbin hook is going around and round and round and it grabs that top thread and then hooks that bobbin thread right through it, creating the lock stitch. So all of our modern sewing machines are going to be like this. Yes, there are a couple of exceptions, absolutely. In, we have sergers, of course, which are a different category of sewing machine, and they are used for knit fabric. It's kind of like the seams you see inside of your t-shirt. That's what a serger is. Then there is a chain stitch, which just is one top needle that makes stitches. Sometimes little kids like play sewing machines will be that way. And there are actually industrial sewing machines that create a, a chain stitch. But a lock stitch is what the home sew sewing machines are going to create. So I hope everyone has a better idea of how our sewing machines actually work. And now I want to break your brain just a little bit because we are going to talk about that bobbin section. So that bobbin can, can look two different ways. That bobbin can go in the front or in the top. So I'm going to go back to that last graphic. So the bobbin is the red part. 
And that bobbin in this image is sitting below the needle at the front of it, because that's how we're looking at it, because the race, the hook goes around and around and around. But when we are looking at our sewing machines, you can have a front loading sewing machine, which means your bobbin sticks into the front of the machine, or you can have one that the bobbin goes down onto the top of the sewing machine. The race still goes the same way. It just, here's the needle, it hooks it going this way if it's a top loading, and if it's a front loading, it hooks it going this way. So. It's all basically the same thing, but I wanted to make sure to tell you just in case that graphic didn't make sense to you because your sewing machine was laid out with a top loading bobbin. So just kind of turn your brain a little bit and think of what direction it goes in. So now let's meet my team. This is my team of sewing machines. I have uh, four in this picture, uh, it's not the entire team, there, there are more. I'm a bit of a sewing machine collector. Um, so these are the four that I use most commonly. Um, starting in the back, we have the Faf. That is my main machine. It's a Faf 7550. It's not made anymore, but there are ones similar to it that are made now. And it's also... Um, there's still a lot available on the resale market, and it is my favorite sewing machine. It is a modern computerized machine that has a couple of other features, but it's not crazy fancy computerized. I would call it a hybrid machine, meaning it has a lot of manual features that just work through an LCD screen that you press buttons on, but you can't like reprogram it or change what individual stitches look like. I got this sewing machine, uh, well, let's see. So I learned how to sew on a brother's sewing machine and this one. This is my mom's sewing machine and she died uh, 20 years ago and I inherited it from her. It's, it's just, it's an incredible sewing machine. And I mean, having it be my mom's is also kind of makes it close to my heart and makes it something that I really, really like having around. So next up we have the, the Eversone machine. That's the one that's blue. A lot of people haven't heard of the company Eversone. It may not be a name that you've heard of before, but it's a company that was designed by um, the grandson of Bernina. I believe I got that one right. Uh, and it's just fantastic. It has a much lower price point for absolutely kick butt machines. My sewing partner has a Vi Viking Husqvarna. It's one of the very high end sewing machines. And she says that this ever sewn is just as smooth, is just as wonderful as those high-end machines. This is the Eversewn 15. It is 100% manual. There is nothing computerized about it. And I have four of them. We use them for sewing classes. So everyone has the exact same machine and I don't have to try to teach everyone about their own individual machine. I also love that it's completely manual because there's no computers to confuse anyone and you don't have to reboot your sewing machine if something goes wrong. Next up, I have a brother sewing machine. Uh, that one's actually an embroidery machine. I have it because I love doing machine embroidery, but I also included it in this picture because it does have a drop in bottom bobbin from the top. So I, I'm very aware of how those work, even though all my other sewing machines, they have a front loading bobbin. It's my personal preference, but it doesn't mean it's better or worse. It happens to be literally what I learned on. And when you're picking a sewing machine, what you learn on is probably gonna be what you stick with. So if you start with a brother machine, even if you want to upgrade to a better sewing machine eventually, you're probably gonna stick with a brother because that's what you have, that's what you know, you're already used to the way that brother does things. And 
so a lot of people just they stick in one path it's the type of machine they like the brand they like and they keep going obviously you can see here i'm not very brand loyal i just kind of I like sewing machines and I'm more feature loyal, which brings us to my last sewing machine here, which is the Greens Vintage Singer up front that um, was my mom's sewing machine that she sewed on through most of the 70s, maybe the 60s. She actually made her sewing machine, I'm sorry, she actually made her wedding dress on the sewing machine but it wasn't originally her wedding dress. It was her friend's wedding dress, but then she borrowed the wedding dress back and got married in it. So technically she did make her own wedding dress. Nonetheless, sorry, crazy story. But this sewing machine is 100% manual. It does not have a zigzag. It goes forward and backwards, but I love this sewing machine, not only for the nostalgia factor, but because it makes absolutely the most gorgeous straight stitch because it's the only thing it does it is absolutely perfect at the one thing it does and sometimes that's okay a lot of people who do quilting love machines that only do straight stitch because as a quilter they only ever use straight stitch so why not have a sewing machine that's going to do the one thing that they want to do the absolute best it possibly can. So maybe you have a vintage machine sitting around and you're like, I can't use this, it's too old. Ha, <laughs> it's not. And I have machines that are older than this that, that need a little bit of repair work, but um, they still work. There is nothing wrong with an older machine. It needs a little oil, a little bit of cleaning and love, and it's still gonna do a lot of work for you. They are truly workhorses. So it's time for a sewing machine tour. So it's gonna be just a moment while I switch over the camera to the sewing machine. And I'm gonna take a quick second before I do that to read any of the comments that Dan has put over in my direction. Okay. Ah, people wanted to know about ripping out stitches. Is there an easy way to do it? Well, yes and no, it depends. I'll see if I can make up a sample for us to watch me seam rip. Um, also, there's a lot of questions about different feet. Okay, we're gonna go through the feet that my Eversewn came with, and that covers at least some of the feet out there, but we can certainly cover more of them if we have enough time. Okay, so let's switch over to my other camera. Okay, here we go. I am at my Eversewn right here. As I said, I love it. It's truly wonderful and I've lost the picture. One moment, let's get that back for you. Oh goodness, okay, give me one moment. I should be able to get that picture back and here it is. Okay, I'm just gonna wait a moment to make sure everything's working again. Yep, okay. So now let me talk about this Eversewn machine. As I mentioned, it is Kim completely manual. There is nothing computerized about it. There's no screen here, which I push to adjust anything. And the great thing about manual machines is you know that the computer is never screwed up. So if you are new to sewing, sometimes those computers, they just are overwhelming because you think that the computer did something weird and you're not really sure what's going on, but this everything everything is adjusted right here in front of your eyes. So I'm going to start the tour of this sewing machine to just walk you through all the different parts. So let's thread up the sewing machine as I go so I can show you all those lovely pieces of it. First we have our spool pins. This is a horizontal spool pin and this is a vertical one. This actually comes off so it came as an accessory and you see that little circle around it? That's a piece of felt that sits down here. 
so that when your spool's on top of it, it will still spin and not get caught. So there is a horizontal and a vertical spool pin, and that's because some threads like one versus the other. Also, if you ever want to use a twin needle, that is a, um, a needle that there's actually two needles coming off of it to do really beautiful top stitching, you actually need two spool pins because you're going to have two spools of thread. So if your thread is cross wound, which means you see these little X's on this purple spool of thread, it's going to prefer to be on a horizontal spool pin. If your thread is stacked, meaning you just see horizontal lines, it's going to prefer to be on a vertical spool pin. That doesn't mean that you can't use either of these for this. It's just a prefer. If you're having problems, this is something to check. So the first thing I need to do is turn on my sewing machine and then we need to actually wind a bobbin. So I'm going to go right up top here so you can see my threading guides and I'll move this light so maybe it won't shine so terribly. So this spool of thread I have prefers a horizontal spool pin, so that's what I'm going to use. And then we have a little spool cap that just keeps this from flying off. And I'm going to make a note here. I actually put this on wrong, so I had a chance to show you. You see all these little catches here? That is something that this thread is going to constantly be rubbing against as it comes off. So the best option is to actually put it on the other way. Of course, I've now lost the spool pin. Here it is. So that as the thread is coming off, it has a smooth edge to come around. Or to use a spool pin cap that sticks out so there's no chance of it rubbing along the edge. And now I need to wind my bobbin. So I have marks here on the top which happen to be this dashed line that shows me exactly how to wind my bobbin. So I'm going to go around that and then over here to my bobbin. I will tell you that every person who sews has an opinion about how to wind a bobbin. And I'm not going to tell you mine is right. But if you stick this thread up through the hole in the top of your bobbin, and then you stick it on your bobbin pin, you'll be able to hold this as it starts. Now you need to push your spool, I'm sorry, your bobbin over or engage it in whatever way your sewing machine does. Mine pushes over. Let me show you here, this way and that way. And then you need to find the bobbin. I have the presser foot here because I am standing at a table that's too tall for the presser foot to end up on the floor. So sorry for the slight awkwardness here. So I'm going to hold this thread at the top and I'm going to get my bobbin going. But you see what happened here? That thread tried to duck underneath my bobbin. And that is such a common problem that people have. So that first little bit of your bobbin while you're getting it started, it is a really good idea to use your fingers to get it to go right on so you don't have that problem of it ducking down under. And then you have a huge thread nest that you need to deal with. I just trim that little piece off the top and then pedal to the metal fill up that bobbin. I hear a lot of people tell me that, oh, you shouldn't go that fast when you do a bobbin. It's really okay. It actually is good for your machine to occasionally go really fast. It's good for the engine. So you see this little white piece here? Let me get closer. It kind of sticks out and it's designed to stop the bobbin when it's full enough. But rarely do these mechanisms actually stop the bobbin effectively. So it's just a good idea to watch out for when your bobbin is full enough and it will, and then just stop it. Or if the mechanism works, it'll push it over and turn it off. So when I push this over, my machine actually stops moving the needle. So I'm going to press it down. 
my needle doesn't move. And that is one of the few automatic features of this machine. Some machines will have a button to push or two parts of the hand wheel here that allow you to disengage the needle while you're sewing a bobbin. You don't have to disengage the needle, but you totally can. And if you have a sewing project that's currently underneath there because you ran out of thread in the middle of sewing, that's a good reason to disengage the bobbin or the disengage the needle, that is. So I'm gonna pull this bobbin off of here and we're gonna leave it just sitting here and take care of threading up our machine the rest of the way. So I have my thread here and then I need to follow all the guides on my machine. It will tell me exactly where my thread needs to go. Some vintage machines will not have arrows. Some of them will have numbers, but we're gonna go around here. So if you check here, it has the dashed line and the solid line. So I need to make sure to get that one. Then I'm gonna go down the front here. And now I need to go around the circle and come back up here to the top. If you don't see something here on your sewing machine when you go around this U, it's because your needle isn't all the way up. This is called the uptake lever. And this part of the machine tends to be one of the most problematic parts that people have issues with. They forget to go around it or they forget so much about the things you need to do with the uptake lever. So this is the uptake lever and we're gonna be talking about it a lot. To get the uptake lever to come up, you turn that hand wheel towards you, always towards you, and the uptake lever will appear. I've already gone around it, so now I'm gonna go down. And I have one less last guide right above my needle. And then I need to actually get the thread through the eye of my needle. This is my automatic needle threader. And I say that with really huge air quotes, it's only automatic when it works. Oh my gosh, it worked. So here's a little loop of thread in the back. So it's not done. It's not like it magically fixed it, but now I get to pull on this extra thread in the loop until I have only one thread coming through. So this is my automatic needle threader. You can actually get these aftermarket if your sewing machine doesn't come with one or if you just really hate threading your machine by hand. This is a great, a great add-on. So now that we have our thread through the top of our machine, it's time to add the thread to the bottom. This is my accessory box. Um, I actually saw recently that somebody had had their machine for five years and never knew this, there was an accessory box and most of them come with exciting things inside. This one's empty because I have all the exciting things next to the machine. There's also a wonderful meme where people fill these with M&Ms to eat while sewing, highly approved. So now I have a door that opens, and this is my bobbin case. So this is a front loading machine. If you had a top loading machine, you wouldn't have to take off all this stuff and open it. So we're gonna take out the bobbin case. There's a little lever here. We pull it out, and I want you to notice that this arm here is up. It is facing up. Now we're gonna take a look at our bobbin case. So it looks like a donut in the middle and that is where our bobbin is going to go. We got our bobbin right here. But we have to figure out which way it goes in. And that is all about this little swoosh here. That little swoosh and that tiny hook at the end right above my thumbnail is what we need to worry about. And we need to make sure that our thread is coming off this bobbin and then it's gonna turn around. It's gonna go in the opposite direction as that swoosh because we actually want to slow down our thread. If it gets going too fast, it can actually loop around the center of the donut. So my thread is coming off like this and my swoosh is headed this way, so it's perfect. So I pull it down and then I pull it into the swoosh and then I hook it. Did you hear that little bitty snap that it made, that little click, that is perfect, because now I know that it is hooked right underneath there and is ready. 
To put it back in my sewing machine, I need to grab this little arm here. And this arm is the only thing keeping that bobbin in. If you let go and help hold it downward, it is going to fall out. That arm here is gonna point up. And you do need to make sure the needle of your machine is up or it's not gonna go in. To give it a little wiggle back and forth. Let it go, it's not falling out. I generally give it my machine handle a little bit of a wiggle to make sure everything is staying in. And then we need to bring our bottom thread to the top. So what I'm going to need to do is hold this thread up here and then I'm going to turn the hand wheel towards me. So my needle's going to go down, going to go up and you see that thread crossing and you pull it and it pulls all the way up. But oh my, it's not coming. Oh gosh, it's broken. No, it's not. The only problem that's going on here is that uptake lever right here. The moment that I get that uptake lever all the way to the top, this releases and I can get everything. That is actually the only thing that's wrong when people get huge thread nests or they get their project and they can't yank it out of the machine. That's because the uptake lever isn't up, which means your needle is all the way up. And that is what actually releases the thread from the bobbin area. And just that one tip, it's going to fix so many problems. Every time you sew, make sure the needle is absolutely up before you take your project out. Close that up here. Uh, you can actually sew without this front panel here because this part here is called a free arm. Not all sewing machines have a free arm, but most of them do. And free arms are super useful when you are trying to sew around a very small circle, like my sleeve or a pant leg. However, if you don't have a free arm, there's no reason you can't sew with everything facing the other direction or up. So it's not something that's, you know, a deal breaker in my mind when it comes to picking out a sewing machine. I want to make a note that my needle is up here. Um, I am going to be playing with all the dials and everything, and if my needle was down, I might have a chance of breaking it because some of these dials are going to move the needle back and forth. I'm gonna grab a piece of fabric. It'll be just a second and I'll be back so I can show you how it works. Okay, I'm back. I have fabric now. So we're gonna stick our fabric in here and on the back, I have a lever that moves up and down. For some people, this lever is here. Some people, it's on the back. You are going to be using this lever constantly. So you need to figure out where it is and how to comfortably grab it. Which hand you like grabbing it most with. Just figure out the way that works best for you. So my fabric went in. That is down and now we're just going to do however the sewing machine is set right now whatever the setting is I literally don't know excellent we have a straight stitch that is pretty long let me show you where those settings are now that we know what the stitch looks like it'll be easier for you to understand so on this wheel here we have straight stitches zigzag i'm looking at the black at the moment zigzag and then we go into other fancy stitches around here now when we look at the top here this is the length adjustment so we just made a long stitch and it was set at four so these black numbers here correspond to the black stitches here and if you want to go to the other stitches you can switch it to S1 or S2, but once you switch to those other stitches, you don't get to control the length anymore. The only time you can control the length is on the black stitches, because this is our length dial. Up here, we have our width dial. So here we can see it's a straight line and then it turns into a zigzag. That is the width. 
And when I am sewing with a straight stitch, it actually affects my needle. So I'm moving the width here. Now I'm gonna drop down to my needle and I'm gonna move that width again. So this allows me to adjust the placement of my needle. This is really helpful when you wanna sew near to an edge or maybe you're dealing with a weird seam allowance and you can adjust everything so you can still put the fabric right on the edge of your foot if you want, but then move your needle to a place that makes more sense for you. Next to that, we have this really odd looking diagram, but this is tension. That is what actually controls the tension of your machine. That is how hard the top is pulling. On some sewing machines, you can see them. You can't on mine, but right in between here are my tension discs. They are two metal discs that push into each other. So if this is super high, they're gonna be pushing super, super hard against each other. And if this is super low, they're gonna be barely touching each other even. Every sewing machine tends to have a happy spot. So my sewing machine actually marks its happy spot. You see how there's this line that connects these numbers? So the five has a line that connects the four and the three, and then there's no line. These are, quote, the optimal tension. This is what the sewing machine manufacturer believes is the best tension for the machine. And if your tension needs to be crazy out here to make things work, there might be another problem. But, but what does make things work? Let's talk about what tension actually does to our, our stitch. So here's my stitch, and um, I have purple in the top and the bottom, which was probably a questionable decision on my part, so let me change that out for you. The easiest way to adjust your tension is to have a different thread in the top and the bottom, and it will make it so you can see what's going on. So I'm going to stick some pink thread in the bottom. Again, I rotate my hand wheel until it comes all the way up to the top and it releases that thread. There we go. Okay. Now let's do that stitch again and evaluate our tension. I am going to change up the machine to a straight stitch and an average length, which is about 2.5. I put my fabric in, press your foot down. Forgetting to put your presser foot down, totally common. Especially if you're dealing with something really thick, it's really easy for it to put your presser foot down. There we go. I have my fabric here. And if you look at this side, you only see a purple stitch. You don't see any of that pink going through. We're looking at this one right here. And when I pop to the back side on this massively printed fabric, you only see pink, or you see only a tiny little bit of purple. Here you can see that purple popping through the top at the very end. So then you have to ask yourself, is this good enough for me? Because you want the connection between the pink and the purple to be literally right between the fabric. You want that connection point to be hidden. So only your bobbin shows on the bottom and only your top thread shows on the top. Quite frankly, I am completely happy with this. I am going to throw it off terribly and see if we can get it to malfunction on us. So I have dialed that up to nine. So that means that the top thread is gonna be held really tightly so our bobbin thread, the pink, should be pulled up to the top. It even sounded different. Oh, and that's because I have unthreaded my needle. I manage to unthread my needle um, all the time. And that's because of one specific thing. 
I've gotten really, really used to my computerized sewing machine that always stops that uptake lever in the up position. And when it stops in the up position, you always have enough thread when you start sewing again. But if you stop the needle, if you stop the uptake lever anywhere but there, and you cut your thread too close, it unthreads your needle the moment you start sewing. I have worked on projects that I literally do this 10 or 15 times in an hour. Sorry for the crazy shaking. I'm on top of a filing cabinet right now. So let's see how that did. Yeah, I didn't really pull the pink up, but it did do some crazy stuff at the bottom. So that definitely tells me that something was wrong with this tension and I would investigate further to try to figure out what the issue is. This machine just generally always likes me. That's one of the reasons I use it for students is because even when the tension is crazy off, it still makes a decent stitch. And that just makes me happy because it gives students a much higher chance of success because they're not dealing with a temperamental sewing machine. So let's uh, continue the sewing machine tour, but um, get on with the rest of it. Oh, we have a reverse button here. So when I hold that down, it will reverse. At the beginning and the end of a seam, it's a good idea to do a back stitch that is the reverse and it will secure that seam so it can't just start to become undone. So I'm gonna turn this way and show you that I have a thread cutter on the side, but I'll tell you, I really like using these little snips. They're super useful and I can get much closer to the fabric with them. So that's one of those tools that I tend to use. Up here at the top, this is a pressure control. So this controls how much this thing pushes down. It's not something that you find in every sewing machine, even brand new ones. And sometimes this is over here on the side. A lot of fancy machines just have an auto sensor that changes the pressure of the presser foot. This is useful if you're using a really thin fabric or really dense fabric or you're doing a super stretchy knit. That's when you might need to adjust it. On most projects though, just leave it alone if it's giving you the stitch you like. On the back here, we've already mentioned that we have our lever that picks up our presser foot. You can see that we have a handle built in here. And down at the bottom, we have all of our information about the exact sewing machine and everything else. And I'm going to rotate it around the other way so I don't tie myself up in the cord. I believe we've talked about everything on the front here. And our last side has our hand wheel. As I mentioned before, some hand wheels will have a button in the center, like a toggle or you may just have a separate circle. And that's how you can disengage the needle when you're winding a bobbin. And down here we have our on and off switch, our power cords. And if you have a fancy machine that can take a card with different stitches, you're gonna find all of that stuff kind of over here. So we had some questions about different sewing machine feet and accessories. So I'm gonna just bring into frame what came with this sewing machine. Again, I'm sorry, my, uh, my picture just disappeared. It should be back in just a moment. Here it is again. Sorry about that. So I have my buttonhole foot here. Buttonhole foots are gonna kinda be like crazy and long. And to put it on, you have to take the foot of the machine off. Some machines have a button on the back that releases it, which is what I just did. Let me see if I can get you a view of that button. So right here, that's the button that releases that foot. Some machines don't have a release. You just kind of angle it and pop it off. And 
And then we have our foot here. We, this part of the foot, get back over here, is actually designed to accept a button. So this is what determines the size, what your buttonhole is going to be. You just take the button, let's just pretend my finger's the button, and you stick the button in this little section until it fits the button. And that's how you determine the length of your buttonhole. Also, one thing that's uh, often missed is machines of this type, they have this piece here. You have to pull it down and engage it in order for that buttonhole foot to work. Now, I'm not sticking this on my machine at the moment because I don't remember if the button spot goes in the back of the machine or in the front of the machine. And I don't want to put it on and have you think that it's the right way. So we're just going to leave it off for the moment. Before I did a buttonhole, I would definitely check it out because my other machine has like a little picture that tells me which side is front, so I can't forget. But I will stick on this foot here. I know it's the one we already used, but I wanted to show you how you stick it on. You put it kind of lined up and then you just drop your presser foot onto it and it will accept it. And you press that button, release it again. The only other foot that came with this machine is this crazy weird foot and it's actually designed for sewing on buttons. You can sew on buttons with a zigzag that is set to the width of the holes and with a length of basically zero and then you can sew on buttons with your machine. You do need one additional accessory, which is a cover for the feed dogs. Feed dogs, what are feed dogs? I haven't mentioned them yet. You're absolutely right. Let's talk about those. The feed dogs are right here. And dare say it, I probably should have mentioned them first. They are what makes your fabric move forward. So the way to remember Feed dogs is that sled dogs. So sled dogs pull and feed dogs pull. So I'm gonna take my needle out. So right here's my needle bar and my hand is holding the screw. I'm going to turn that towards me and take the needle out. Sure I am, it's not gonna come. That's why sewing machines come with a screwdriver. It's a crazy looking screwdriver, but it totally works. I'm going to turn this, take that needle out so I can safely show you how to use, how the feed dogs work. So I'm going to stick my finger in here and I'm going to turn the sewing machine towards me. And every time those feed dogs pick up, it moves my, my finger farther and farther back. So feed dogs are literally what is pulling your fabric through the sewing machine. So when you're sewing on a button, you need a feed dog cover or to drop your feed dogs if your machine has that function so that your feed dogs aren't moving the fabric you're trying to sew a button onto. And let's talk about our needle for a moment. So needles have a flat back and a rounded front, which I realize you can't really see, it's super small. But I'm gonna also tell you that written on the insanely tiny shank, oh my gosh, I can actually see it with my camera, is the size of the needle. So we're gonna get into needles in just a moment, but I wanted to let you know that if you take a needle out of the package and cannot figure out what size it is, get out a magnifying glass or use your phone camera and you can figure it out. So the flat side, goes to the back of your machine in a modern machine it goes away from your bobbin that is really the best thing to think about is away from your bobbin because if you're using a vintage machine some of them have their bobbins over here which means the needle actually goes in sideways and the back goes that way so it always has to go away from your bobbin so push the needle in far far up make sure it can't go any farther and then you just tighten that needle back up Okay, I think we're done with our sewing machine tour, so I'm going to switch back over to the computer so I can catch up on your questions. Okay, I'm back at the computer. Here we go, I am back. 
thank you guys so much for sticking with that. I hope that I was able to really explain to you how a sewing machine works and all the different parts and pieces. So we just went through like the most simple basic sewing machine, which is purely mechanical or a vintage machine. And a hybrid machine has some features like a computer, but it really only controls the stitch width, width and length and does some other basic little things. And then you have a fully computerized machine that generally has like a huge computer and you can do things like even create your own stitches. So we did our sewing machine tour. You can see I got ahead of myself. And I just wanted to talk about these few tiny features that you didn't see on this machine. Um, the purple arrow is a reverse button. I just wanted to get that out of the way. That machine totally had a reverse button. The pink arrow is a needle up, needle down which means every time I stop the machine, the needle stops in the position that I've asked to stop. And that was what I was talking about, how I keep forgetting to stop with the uptake lever all the way up because my Fof has this button that I press and it just always puts the needle in the right place, which is quite frankly, my favorite feature. It is like every time I'm looking at a sewing machine, it's gotta have that feature because it just, it makes it easier. It speeds things up. But industrial sewing machines rarely have that feature and people use them constantly. So it's not like you can't be trained to actually remember to turn that wheel and to make sure that thread ends up in the right spot and the uptake levers are the way up. There's a start stop button, which personally, I don't see the point in. It is literally a button that you just press and the sewing machine will start or the sewing machine will stop. I think it got added when the bodies of embroidery machines started being used for regular sewing machines. It was already there for an embroidery machine, so they just kept it. However, if you have any difficulty with your, your knees or hips and using the pedal of a sewing machine is just really difficult, the start and stop button is awesome. And lastly, we have the blue arrow, which is speed control. And speed control is a feature that so many people like. It just makes it so you can slow down your machine. So no matter how hard you press on that pedal, it's not gonna go faster than a certain amount, a governor if you want to say. And this is a great feature for kids or beginners because they don't have to work so hard at keeping the machine from going too fast. I personally love an epically fast sewing machine. So I don't really like machines that have this feature because I find that overall, those machines tend to be a little bit slower and I like sewing fast. I mean, I have an industrial sewing machine that just can speed through stuff so quickly. And so, as I said, this is not a feature that I personally love for me but when I'm teaching my kids to sew, oh yeah. It means that no matter how hard they press, they're not gonna be able to jackrabbit themselves out of where they are. If you are looking to buy a sewing machine, I have a sewing machine buyer's guide. And after this webinar is done, there's going to be an email that has the replay link, but also it's going to have a link to this sewing machine buyer's guide kind of lays out all the different parts of a sewing machine and which ones are important to you so that you have a chance of actually getting the machine that you want. Maybe that start and stop button is really important to you. And so you need to make that a feature that's important. Or maybe you don't really see the purpose of a zigzag. It's never gonna be something you use. So that'll help you pick a machine that is the right one for you. So you don't spend extra money buying a machine with features you don't need and you don't end up with a machine that has a feature that you so wish you had. Uh, if you are watching this on YouTube later and you're not getting an email because you got the notification that was alive, you can just check the description right below here and I have the link so you can go get the sewing machine buyer's guide. <coughs> Obviously when we're sewing, our fabric, our needle, our thread, it's, it's what we're using. 
And so I wanted to take a quick note to mention that I personally love Guterman sewing thread. It has created the fewest problems in my machines over the years and the least amount of fluff. I'm not telling you to go throw out your Coates and Clark thread, but next time you buy it, get something better. <coughs> Pardon me. And thread is just not really a place to buy from the dollar bin because it will create so much fluff inside of your sewing machine. <coughs> Pardon me, I have a tickle in my throat. And because needles are so important to our sewing machines, I also have a pick the perfect needle guide. And this is also in a link below or will be in your email box. So you can get this guide. So every time you're sitting down to look at a project, you can say, what is my fabric type? How thick is it? This is the needle that I need. Sharp needles are used for woven and ballpoint needles are used for knit. And they have different thicknesses based off of the thickness of fabric you're using. Ballpoint needles can also be called stretch or jersey. They have so many different names, but in the end, they're all ballpoint. If you happen to have a needle you've been sewing with for an epically long time, it's probably a ballpoint by now because you've worn it down. So if you take it and stab yourself in the finger and it doesn't really hurt, you now have a ballpoint needle. I don't recommend that, but I mean, in a pinch, it works. Also, there are universal needles, and universal needles are kind of bad at everything. They'll work, they will sew woven, they will sew knit, but they're not great at either. Remember my vintage machine? It does a straight stitch. It is perfect at a straight stitch because that's its one job. <coughs> so sometimes your needle needs one job. <coughs> Sorry about that. This tickle just keeps coming back. <coughs> so when you're working at the sewing machine, there's just an order that you need to sew in and it will help alleviate so many of the problems that you have. And you can kind of say it like a little kid's playground chant. Needle up, thread back, fabric in, foot down, back stitch, and sew. And when you're done with a line of stitching, you back stitch, needle up, foot up, pull and cut. And I think the important, the most important thing of both of those is the needle up. Always need to start with your needle up. You always need to stop with your needle up. And that right there will solve so many sewing problems. We talked about tension just a little bit when I was doing the sewing machine tour, but a proper lock stitch always has those two threads meeting right in between. If you're doing a fancy stitch, where like uh, one of the multiple fancy stitches on your sewing machine, like it's supposed to look like a design instead of be construction, it's okay to have the top needle pull to the bottom just a little bit and that makes it so you never have that connection showing because those designs are notorious for pulling the bottom thread up to the top, which kind of ruins the look. A loopy bottom is almost always fixed by just re-threading. Something got missed or there is dust somewhere. And if the top thread pulls out of the needle every time you start sewing, it's because you didn't leave enough thread or you didn't stop with that uptake lever all the way up. So I know I just covered a lot. There, I love sewing machines and I'm sure you can tell that by how much I can talk about sewing and my love of sewing. But I'd like to hear from you to tell me what did you glean from today? What was that part of my talk that just, just really made it worthwhile for you. What did you learn from today? I would love for you to just pop that in the chat real quick so that I can know a little bit more about the important parts and figure out what 
you guys would like me to cover more in the future and what I should maybe spend time more time on next time. So take a moment and pop that in the chat and tell me what did you learn today? So I'm going to take a moment while you pop that in the chat to tell you a quick story about me and why I'm here teaching you. In 2013, I had twins. Yeah, my hands are full. And as you saw in the first picture, they're not babies anymore. They're actually seven. And they do have a bit of there can be only one Highlander mentality. Oh, yeah. They are, they are kind of crazy. Well, back in the early years of having my kids, I couldn't have a normal job because the high cost of health care, the high cost of child care, and honestly, I wanted to be with my kids. I needed a non-traditional career, and that's why I'm here. I couldn't work, but I could sew. I've been sewing for so long. I know I can sew. So I started sewing to make some extra income. I did customs, alterations, and then I started designing patterns because people kept coming to me with, can you make something for this? And I'm like, well, I mean, once I've made it once, why not make more people be able to make it? And then I started making my instructions really detailed because a lot of the part of sewing that I love is that little finesse, those little things like being told, hey, you're going to have to like tuck the corner in here or you've got to make sure to trim off that seam allowance or it's just not going to work right. And so I really got into those instructions and making them so clear. And then people started asking me questions about sewing. And I realized <coughs> they were missing the fundamentals. <coughs> it's like they were trying to sew an entire shirt without knowing how to adjust their stitch length. They were missing the basics, or as one of my students recently said, she was sewing without a license. And then I realized that all of these little bitty conversations I had with people that were helping them really love sewing and be able to solve their problems, it just made them so happy. And I wanted to help more people. And so I designed a course that is all for beginners. And it's called Zero to Sew. And I would love to tell you more about it, but um, I'd like to ask your permission first because you guys have stuck with me. You're here and I am not gonna bore you if nobody wants to hear about the class. It's called Zero to Sew and I really want to be able to help more people sew. So you'd like to hear more? Let me know. Let me hop back over to my slides here so you guys can see if I had anything else waiting. Okay, sorry for that bit of silence. I was just catching up on the chat. And so um, I'm going to tell you about Zero to Sew and then we're going to have a Q&A session. Um, I will note about the Q&A, there is like a five second delay. So how about you just start throwing your questions in now? And when I'm done telling you about the course, um, my husband, I can see him on the window next to me. He is already typing your questions. So yes, thank you. Um, so I will get to those in just a moment. Zero to so. As the name says, it's for complete beginners. It is the, I'm afraid to take my sewing machine out of the box. We actually unbox a sewing machine during the class. I tell you what every little thing is. I know I did a sewing machine tour today, but we get into everything because I want you and 
people in my class, and everyone, quite frankly, to understand how their sewing machine works and all the bits and pieces because understanding it just makes it so much easier. During the class, we are going to make these four different projects. We have a pin cushion, which is our first project. And then we have a mug rug or coaster. That's what's underneath my mug there. Then we make a zippered pouch. Yeah, I'm gonna teach you how to put in a zipper. It's really not that hard. You just need it explained properly. And we do do the world's easiest zipper, but, but it's a zipper. You're gonna be able to put in a zipper after the class. And lastly, we tackle knits. So that um, blue fox thing is actually a headband. And so you get a primer on learning how to do knit fabric as well. When you sign into the course, even now, if you choose to just go look at it, you'll actually be able to see the entire first section about supplies is 100% available. Even if you don't want to take my course, go over there and watch all the part on supplies because it'll get you set up for everything. I literally explain the different type of seam rippers, the different type of pins and needles and scissors. So all of the information you may want about supplies or at least the very basic supplies, it's there. Go look at it. I'm using the Teachable platform and it also allows you to keep track of where you are in the class. So you can really know where you are. Like every single video is short and simple. They're about, I think my longest video on there is 20 minutes and that's a complete outlier. Most of them are two to three minute videos. So you can take it, it's just a little bite and you can do that one step or, and you don't have to pause in these huge long videos to try to figure out where you are. They're just, they're little bites of information so that you can take it one piece at a time. There's none of that information overload, that insanity that you start to feel when like all that information just starts coming at you. It's, it's just little bites at a time so that you can take those steps from zero to being able to sew in a zipper and make a headband. You will be fearless when you are done. And um, I know we talked about YouTube videos earlier and like, well, I mean, all this information is out here, but I'm sure you've seen the difference between a YouTube video that you just randomly pick and me. So I know how to teach and teaching is my love. I love teaching and I'm 100% committed to making sure that my students and quite frankly, everyone on the internet who asks me a question, that I'm here to answer it. I love teaching. And I'm sure you're probably pretty tired of hearing me rattle on at this point, but um, this is some stuff that my students have said and I'm just going to leave it right up there and check over to the chat questions to figure out um, what we should talk about in our last few minutes here. Okay, so we have, we have ripping out stitches still. Okay, let me go grab my seam ripper. Um, then we have different feet. Um, walking foot, bias binding foot, twin needles. Um, okay, excellent. I'm gonna grab my seam ripper real quick. Seeing that I'm literally in my sewing room right now, it's not like there's um, a lack of seam rippers practically everywhere. So, of course. Okay. Let's see how we, okay, so this is my seam ripper. And I will figure out how to make the camera focus. And this seam ripper does not have a red ball because this seam ripper came with the sewing machine and it's cheap but you really need a red ball on that seam ripper because the easiest way to seam rip something is to place that red ball in between the layers of fabric 
and to push. All you have to do is push. And that little red ball separates the layers of fabric as you're pushing so that you can seam rip just by pushing your fingers through the middle. But you can see this doesn't have a red ball on it. So when I was pushing through that seam, all it did was catch the fabric and rip it. I actually have an entire video about picking the perfect seam ripper and why that red ball is so important. I also have a video about how to take out surging, which is way simpler than, than it should be. Quite frankly, I think it's easier than taking out just plain stitches sometimes because once you release one, it's like it all just falls apart into pieces. It's, it's so satisfying. Okay, so um, ideal table height. Oh gosh, that is all about you and your ideal table height and your height. So I'm 5'8", and I have a long torso. And okay, so basically when you're trying to pick out a, a sewing machine, a height for a cutting counter, it needs to be where your arms are really comfortable. It needs to be maybe slightly lower than when your arms are at a 90 degree angle. So you have a good amount of force to be able to push down on a rotary cutter. And so you're not constantly bending over and leaning and hurting yourself. A lot of people really like a, like a kitchen counter as the perfect height. And that's what I've done actually. Um, my cutting table, which is right over there, is actually the base cabinet for a kitchen island. And on top of it, my um, cutting surface is a solid core door that never had a handle put in it. And it's just, it's on top of it. And it makes an excellent sturdy work surface that's huge. And I realize not everyone has the space to be able to put in a kitchen island and a huge door, but it was the right option for me. And I love being able to upcycle and recycle. And that's actually the base cabinet from the house I grew up in. It wasn't attached to the floor, so my dad took it out when we moved. So we've had that around for quite a while and it's just perfect because it has so many drawers and it has an enormous drawer in the bottom that I can put all of those, those big things that don't really work right um, in the little drawers. And I have a drawer just for rotary cutters and a drawer just for scissors because I keep collecting them because I love scissors and you can always try out the new type. Um, a Something that may really work for you when trying to pick out the right height for both sewing and cutting, particularly if you are going to be using just one table and you're trying to like, what is the one table I can use? Either you can get bed risers to put underneath your table that bring it up to the right height for standing. You can also put soup cans under there or PVC pipes, but you can also just get an adjustable height desk. They're, they're not cheap, but they're way less expensive than they used to be. And you could literally program it to be like, this is my sitting height for sewing machine. And this is my standing height for when I want to cut things. So that is totally an option. And I mean, they're not super cheap, but I've seen them for $300 recently, which is, they used to be several thousand. So if you're looking for the one table that's going to make your life easier to not hurt your body when you're cutting and leaning. It's a great option. Okay, let's look at the last few things. Oh, I didn't mention, if you are interested in the Zero to Sew class, which of course I would love you to be interested because I want to teach you more about sewing. There is a link in the description. Everyone will be emailed the link as well. And here it is on the page. Um, Today and tomorrow, I am doing early bird pricing, which is $97. And um, on Friday, the price goes up. So if you're interested, just get it while you can and save yourself some money later. I, I would really like to teach everyone how to sew because obviously I think it is 
a really important thing in my life from being a mental relaxation, a way to make money and literally life saving sometimes. It, I just want to be able to teach everyone how to sew in a way that makes sense to them because yeah, sewing is, doesn't have to be hard if you have the right teacher. And I just, I wanna be that teacher for everyone. So let me go back to those questions for a moment. Um, do I have any troubleshooting videos for sergers? Okay, I don't. I have a video on how to remove serger stitches. I have a really old serger that's actually made by Toyota. So it's not the modern serger that most people are using. I will tell you though, I get lots of calls, actually literally on the phone, people that I know calling me, telling me my serger won't work. Specifically, the left needle, keep the thread keeps breaking. Why does it keep, it unthreads itself on the left needle. How is that even possible? And the trick is you literally need to thread from, le from right to left, lower looper, upper looper, right thread, left thread. Now there are ways to cheat around that, which is when your needle threads are down, you can just swipe the thread out from underneath them and then rethread the bottom half. But the moment those threads go down, they have started to hook all the pieces on the bottom. So you can't thread the bottom pieces while the needle threads are engaged. You have to swipe them out from underneath and then you can rethread the bottom. Also, I like to talk about sergers as as a game of tension. Um, it's a tug of war game. So there's a lot of tutorials out there just like, this is the right number to have your serger set at. You need the tension to be at these numbers. Bollocks, absolutely bollocks. It's a tug of war game. So the way to figure out your tug of war game is to set everything to zero to start with. So set it to zero. Make sure that all of those threads are in the actual tension discs we talked about, the ones that are pushing together and holding things. And then set everything to maybe like the middle zone or even just try it out when they're all at zero. Because over time, you're gonna keep ratcheting those tensions up little by little by little. And before you know it, everything's at nines or you're like, how does it need to be this tight? It's cause it's tug of war. The harder and harder each team pulls, the harder they have to pull. So, but if one team was barely even pulling, the other one doesn't have to pull very much to win. So set everything back down to the beginning and start over. And then just look at it a little bit at a time and play with it. Don't be afraid to adjust something and see what happens. Especially if you put every single piece in a different color thread, it will help you know exactly where the problem is. Maybe I should do a video about sergers. I think I just figured that out. <laughs> As I said, I have an old serger, but um, they really do amazing things and they can do so much more than most people use them for. Okay, do I have a tutorial on changing feet and using alphabet letters? The person has a Sparrow 30. When you're using alphabet letters, it classifies as a, a design kind of like embroidery. So it means that that top thread is going to naturally pull a little harder and your bottom thread is gonna pull to the top. So you need to make sure that that top is looser so that thread ends up actually cupping down and around. I also really suggest that you use some interfacing, whether it be you know, actually you buy it and it's called interfacing or just a thicker fabric or more fabric or just starch the crap out of it. You need some actual real sturdiness to be able to put embroidery designs on it, which is what the letters are. Um, if you wanna send me an email, I can talk to you a little bit more about how to get the letters in. I know that there's just, there's a sequence of button pressing that makes it so you can actually put all the letters in. Um, my email address is the ninja at fabric and I'm serious. Send me an email and I'll help you through it. 
Okay, um, let's see this. Okay, um, and the last thing I see here is about a walking foot. So I mentioned I love my Foff, and that's because it has a built-in walking foot. It's called a um, IDT, it's a crazy word. Basically, there's a little finger that sits behind the presser foot and it acts like feed dogs on the top. So remember how my finger kept being pulled forward? Well, this pulls the top layer of fabric forward as well, and it means that everything stays together. When you need a walking foot is when your fabric is thick. It's particularly used by quilters. And it's because that thickness means that there's more distance or lack of grip between the bottom layer and the top layer. So a walking foot makes all those layers move together. And if you don't have a walking foot, the bottom fabric is naturally going to creep just a little bit more in over a really long distance that's super noticeable. So that's why we use a walking foot that just makes everything work together. Or you have a sewing machine that naturally has a walking foot built in, which means that you can use a walking foot with every single crazy foot your sewing machine has. Whereas otherwise your walking foot is only going to be the foot that's attached, which is generally a zigzag, although I've seen them for straight stitch. Okay, let's, let's see. I think, I think that was our last question. Wow. Holy crap, it's 2.30. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. See what happens when you get me talking? <laughs> well, I'm certainly going to try to do lives more often, and maybe we can just have a live Q&A someday on Facebook or here so that I can go through and answer as many sewing machine questions as I can. But really, thank you all for coming. It means the world to me that you came today, and I... I want to let you know that again, there will be a replay. You will see that link in your email box. I totally understand anyone who had to drop out, especially with hearing me talk for an hour and a half. But <laughs> thank you guys for coming. And I really hope you learned something about your sewing machine today. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email or you can always hit me up on my my group on Facebook, which is the Fabric Ninja Sewing Circle. Um, and you have an opportunity in the put your name here information when you sign up there to be added to my newsletter list. And that will just let you know when I come out with freebies and tell you about different coupon codes. And when I have a technique I wanna share with everyone, I make sure to put them in the newsletter. I generally share them in my Facebook group a lot. So thank you so much for coming today. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Dan, husband who's sitting upstairs and has really been helpful. I appreciate you all. Have a wonderful day.